was the stages of the war and the chaotic aftermath of the war. American policy makers were upset as though they were suffering paranoia. As though, after all, there had been some kind of invisible hand, some insidious hand, that had intervened in order to stop that creation of the American century. As though some kind of malevolent force were at work in the world to prevent the scenario of open door expansion from being put into effect. Because you see, those American policy makers were haunted by a specter, the specter of revolution. Or more precisely, the growth and the radicalization of those anti-Nazi resistance movements in occupied Europe, which were not only anti-fascist, not only concerned about ending the fascist control of those occupied countries, but which were in some vague and general way also anti-capitalist, the radicalization, if you please, of those liberation struggles in Asia, which were not only anti-Japanese, but very fiercely anti-colonial, and the impending danger, or so it seemed to American policymakers, of movements whose militants were armed and had experience in underground movements and had become habituated to guerrilla warfare and had no intention of becoming the pliant ballet of American imperialism. And so it was that Eisenhower in his memoirs could talk about those dissident elements who had long seemed, who had long uh, served in the underground and who didn't really adapt themselves again to the requirements of social order as that social order was decreed by our occupation. And in the final analysis, and most importantly, the clear and present danger, as it seemed to American policymakers in the late stages of the war and at the beginning of the post-war era, of movements in which the most active and certainly the best organized fighting legions of those resistance and liberation movements were communist parties. A dilemma, a crisis, an impending catastrophe. Now granted, as we have tried to document and demonstrate, the United States had the economic hut at its disposal in order to bring its imperialistic rivals, and most particularly Great Britain, to their knees. But after all, that mastery in the economic field would have been a hollow victory indeed if the United States then had to face the filling of the political vacuum by all kinds of anti-capitalist regimes, which after all were fattening on that struggle against fascism. After all, suppose the United States faced an entire network of socialist or near-socialist governments in those previously occupied zones. Suppose they faced anti-capitalist regimes which had the idea of developing their own destiny, of developing their own resources, of remaining outside the network of that post-war economic order. Wouldn't that dismantle or wouldn't that threaten that open-door expansionism of the United States? And faced with that potential crisis, can you possibly imagine that American policymakers for a minute entertained a doubt that if that danger were there, that they would have to invoke that corollary of intervention, that interventionist corollary of open-door expansionism by which they meant to police the world, to isolate and to crush the revolutionary pest, and ultimately to quarantine the Soviet Union. Now, with all due respect for the paranoia of ruling classes, who as a matter of fact are perfectly capable of thinking that the world revolution is beginning when a worker talks back, it is literally true nonetheless that the American ruling class did not invent the communist presence at the end of the war. It most certainly was there. And if you examine the statistics, for example, simply on the number of communists who now poured into the parties of the world, you are perfectly aware that that world communist movement emerged from the war for the very first time since the founding of the Comintern in 1919 as a potentially decisive force. Consider the overall numbers, if you please, that in 1939, on the eve of the war, all of the communist parties combined had less than a million members. 
and that in 1945, at the end of the war, those combined communist parties could count more than 14 million members. Or consider the growth of communism in the advanced capitalist world, in that zone, after all, where capitalism was so very vulnerable. And in that advanced capitalist zone, look especially at Italy and France, which have the most important and the most conspicuous communist parties. In Italy, for example, where the Communist Party for 20 years had been tracked and persecuted and driven into exile or underground by fascism, that Communist Party had only 5,000 militants in 1943 and emerged from the war in 1946 with 2 million members in the Italian Communist Party. Or consider that French Communist Party, which went into the war in 1939 with 300,000 members and emerged in 1946 with something like a million. And consider no less that those two parties had really an hegemony over the institutions and over the ideology of the working classes of their countries. Or move into those smaller countries of the advanced capitalist zone. Look, for example, at those seven small countries of Sweden and Norway and Denmark and Finland, of the Netherlands, of Switzerland and of Austria. And those seven countries combined in 1939 enrolled 100,000 in communist parties and enrolled 600,000 by the end of the war. More spectacularly, look to Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, after all, where communism had been a pariah, where it had been a word for a life to join the Communist Party before the war, where those reactionary crypto-fascist regimes had created hell on wheels for anybody who was a communist militant. And so there were just a handful of a few thousand in any of those Balkan countries, and you're talking, you see, about six of those countries that become the so-called popular democracies after the war, in which, in 1947, you have over seven million members of communist parties, and those communist parties are on the threshold of power. Or consider the special case of Greece, that case of Greece where the communists numbered 17,500 in 1935, and where they were almost 80,000 in 1945, and more than that, the very fulcrum of Ilas and Ia, the very fulcrum of the national liberation movement of that year, and of the popular army that was the arm of that national liberation movement. And most spectacularly, think of Asia, and think especially of China. A China, after all, whose Communist Party had 40,000 members in 1937, at the beginning of the struggle against Japanese imperialism, and which in 1945 could count 1,200,000 members in that Chinese Communist Party, and which by 1947, at the time that the party launched its offensive against the Kuomintang had almost 3 million Chinese communists enrolled in that party. And so, habituated as we are to the premises and to the psychosis of the Cold War, it doesn't surprise us very much that American policy makers tracked the burgeoning and the emergence of a European and an Asiatic left with a kind of energy that bordered on frenzy. No matter that those resistance and those liberation movements were after all fighting against and making a contribution to the defeat of Germany and Japan, which presumably were the enemy. No matter after all that the communists were the bravest and most heroic and most indomitable fighters in those legions against fascism in that struggle against German and Japanese occupation. No matter that those governments in exile, so reactionary, which without question the United States and its diplomacy supported, no matter that those governments in exile made virtually no contribution to the anti-fascist struggle and were concerned mainly to plot and plan their way back into power even though they represented so much discredited ruling classes, no matter that the European masses went into the resistance 
and by the hundreds of thousands went into communist parties, not only because of their patriotism, because they wanted to lift the burden of occupation from their countries, because they wanted to end the brutality of fascist rule, but also because of their radicalism, because in some generalized way they had had it with the old order, with an order whose ruling classes and whose institutions had imposed upon them over and again hunger and terror and all of that injustice that tore their lives apart. And it wasn't as though they were thinking about an armed revolution, or it wasn't as though they were thinking about a dictatorship of the Communist Party or a Soviet-style regime. They were talking and thinking about what they called refurbished democracy, that the democratic process should work, and they were talking about reform of structure. But that is the point, you see. It isn't a question of Soviet dictatorship in those countries. It is precisely a question that the peoples had become radicalized enough so that they wanted a new deal in a fundamental sense. That they wanted, after all, to refurbish the institutions of their society that constituted the threat. You see, that is the point about Chile under Allende, isn't it? That it was not a Soviet dictatorship, but that it was an advanced democracy. And that is the point, is it not, about the frenzy over Italy now. That the Communist Party is not calling for a Soviet dictatorship in Italy, but is calling for a refurbished democracy. And all of that to American policymakers constituted a threat to that open door expansionism. That somehow American goods and capital would not get there on the terms that it was supposed to. And consequently, once that was defined as a threat, then the strategy of containment, the strategy, after all, of isolating and crushing this kind of advanced democracy or this kind of socialist tendency became the sine qua non of American diplomacy, but a problem. How is it that you contain and crush and stamp out something that reflects the aspirations of millions of people? Something, after all, that does not demand either dictatorship or the stepping out of liberties? How do you justify that containment? And American policymakers found their ploy easily enough, for they operated upon two assumptions in the late stages of the war and in the early stages of the post-war, two assumptions which proved to be contrary to reality, but which proved to be the functional paranoia of the Cold War. One was, after all, that this European and Asiatic left was infudated to communist parties, that they were the communist parties that ran this left, and that these communist parties, no matter how much they were smooth talking, no matter how much they were muting their radicalism, no matter how much they were insisting upon united fronts against fascism, that they had an ulterior purpose, and that was to establish their dictatorship. And the second assumption, that behind these communist parties, manipulating them, subsidizing them, pushing them, stood the Soviet Union, that Soviet Union expansionist and imperialist that would not end until it had Bolshevized the world. And so it was that Averill, Harry Men, sometimes of Brown Brothers Harry Men of Wall Street, sometimes the son of Edward Harriman, railroad tycoon, always passing in Washington as a great expert on the Soviet Union and how to contain it. And that April Harriman, in a warning of April 1945 to American policymakers, put the terminology down on paper. The Communist Party everywhere are using economic difficulties in areas under our responsibility to promote Soviet concepts and policies and to undermine the influence of the Western allies. We are faced with the domination of Europe by the Soviet Union. 
But back in April of 1945, and at that late date, the top policy makers in Washington didn't need any more warnings because they were convinced that that world domination of the Soviet Union, or so they said, was the imminent threat to American prosperity and to American security. And you understand that, don't you? You understand that if American policymakers cannot face up to the fact in 1945 that it is the collapse of capitalism and the collapse of colonialism, which is really the issue, which is the issue behind that growing radicalization of the European and Asiatic masses, they must look for another explanation. An explanation that is fortified, that is comforting, and that is from A to Z bogus. And that, of course, that explanation of the ubiquitous Red Scare. And we say bogus for two reasons. And fundamental ones, if you are to understand this process of how our contemporary world was born. If you stop to think of how much of what our world did runs on premises for which there is no hard evidence. And I say bogus in the first place because the behavior of Soviet leadership bore no resemblance to the description of it by American policymakers. That Soviet leadership, by which I mean Stalin and his bureaucratic cohorts, that Soviet leadership was working feverishly day and night, not to promote world revolution, but to curtail it wherever it threatened the alliance with the capitalist powers in the war and after the war. And we know perfectly well that the Soviet Union had long since abandoned any interest in world revolution. That Soviet leadership for a long time had subordinated the Communist International to the national purposes of the Soviet Union. That for a long time the Soviet Union had subordinated the Communist parties of that International to the national interest of their home state. There was a time when Stalin spoke like an internationalist and a revolutionary. And I go back to 1925, and I read to you a text because it is so striking in its description of what would become of Soviet policy. Here is Stalin in 1925, and listen well. Support the liberation movement in China, but why? Wouldn't it be dangerous? Wouldn't it bring us into conflict with other countries? Wouldn't it be better if we established spheres of influence in China in conjunction with other advanced powers and snatched something from China for our own benefit? Maintain friendship with Persia, Turkey, and Afghanistan is the game for the candle. Wouldn't it be better to restore the spheres of influence with one another of the great powers? And so on and so forth. Such, says Stalin, is the new type of nationalist frame of mind which is trying to liquidate the foreign policy of the October Revolution. This is the policy of nationalism and degeneration, the path of the complete liquidation of the proletarian international policy. For people afflicted with this disease regard our country not as a part of a whole that is called the world revolutionary movement, but as the beginning and end of that movement, believing that the interests of all other countries should be sacrificed to the interests of our country. And I cite that quotation in which Stalin attacks that nationalism and degeneration because no one could have penned a better description of precisely what happened to Soviet policy under the leadership of Stalin and his men. And so it was that during the war, and right after the war, Stalin was primarily concerned, frenetically concerned, to keep the Grand Alliance together. To keep that alliance together with the United States and Great Britain during the war, so that the Nazi enemy could be defeated, uh, so that the Second Front would be opened, uh, so that the Soviet Union would get proper supply in its horrendous struggle against Germany. 
and concerned to keep that alliance together after the war so that the United States especially should supply Russia in her rehabilitation efforts which would be vast. Never under consideration was the alternative that perhaps a revolutionary policy might have fought against Nazi fascism just as well, or that a revolutionary and socialist Europe might have been a more congenial context for the rehabilitation of the Soviet Union. No, it was Stalin's idea that anything that interfered with, that disturbed that alliance, had to be eliminated. And it was perfectly clear by 1943 uh, that the Allies and especially American policymakers were increasingly apprehensive over the growth of the European left and over the fear uh, that the Soviet Union was behind that left and Stalin bent over backwards, did somersaults to persuade them that that wasn't the case and what more could he do? On the 15th of May of 1943, he dissolved the common terms. Well, he did it without asking anybody. <laughs> and he did it with a sense of urgency. And the urgency was stated by Stalin in an interview which he gave with a journalist from Reuters who said, we in Great Britain are delighted that you, Marshal Stalin, have eliminated the Communist International, but why did you do it? And he answered this way, the dissolution of the Communist International is proper and timely because it facilitates the organization of the common onslaught of all freedom-loving nations against the common enemy Hitlerism. The dissolution of the Communist International is proper because it exposes the lie of the Hitlerites to the effect that Moscow allegedly intends to intervene in the life of other nations and to falsifies them. From now on, an end is put to this calumny, to this lie. Now both of those statements are extremely interesting. The first because it says that everything has to go to keep that alliance. The second because it dismisses 25 years of communist intervention, of, of, of common turn of, of policy as a calumny and a lie. You see under Lenin, that attack was made too, that the common turn is constantly intervening in the affairs of other countries, and Lenin always said, yes, that's right. And that is right, after all, uh, because we are part of an international proletarian revolution. And Stalin say, no, that is calumny and that is lie, and we put an end to it. And it facilitates, he goes on to say, the work of patriots of all countries for uniting the progressive forces of their respective countries, regardless of party and religious faith, into a single camp of national liberation. It is Stalin saying, you see, I am a man of goodwill. Those resistance and liberation movements must be beyond party, beyond religion. They must be broad fronts. They must work within the context of the country in which they are operating. And Stalin did that with the idea that Churchill and Roosevelt would realize that the Soviet Union wasn't going around fomenting revolution at that point. And he did a few other things. What could he do? He invited Metropolitan Sergius, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, and had a long interview with him and restored the church. And then he abolished the International as the anthem of the Soviet Union. Little gestures to get to Roosevelt and Churchill. <laughs> but they're tough guys. And Roosevelt and Churchill not at all persuaded, you see, that just because the common turn was dissolved, that the fine Soviet hand was not behind these communist parties. And so look very carefully at the document of the 15th of May of 1943, which is the official document dissolving the Communist International. And it indicates something important, that through that document, Stalin is saying not only that we are dissolving the common turn, but that if you are afraid that after the war, the communist parties will try something revolutionary, we want to tell you that that is not in our design. 
And so you get in that document of the 15th of May of 43, the following. In the countries of the Hitlerite bloc, the fundamental task of the working class, the toilers and all honest people, consists in giving all help for the defeat of this bloc by the sabotage of Hitlerite military machines from within and by helping to overthrow the governments who are guilty of the war. It doesn't say overthrow monopoly capitalism in Germany and Italy. It says overthrow the governments who are responsible for the war. And it says in the countries of the anti hitlerite coalition, the sacred duty of the widest masses of the people, and in the first place of the foremost workers, consists in aiding by every means the military efforts of the governments of those countries. It doesn't say that those movements should prod those governments into reform. It doesn't say that those governments should be put on the griddle. It says that there should be full collaboration. Because in that document, there is a description of what the resistance and liberation movements are, which limit, potentially, their power to change anything. The war of liberation of the freedom-loving peoples against the Hitlerite tyranny, which has brought into movement the masses of the people, uniting them without difference of party or religion in the ranks of a powerful anti-Hitlerite coalition, has demonstrated with still greater clearness that the general national upsurge and mobilization of the people for the speediest victory over the enemy can be best of all and most fruitfully carried out by the vanguard of the working class movement of each separate country working within the framework of its own country. By which that document is saying that those communist parties will not foment revolution, that insofar as the Russians can control them, insofar as they can direct them, they will be part of an anti-fascist coalition that will not threaten the basic social structure. What else could Stalin do? A year later, in the spring of 1944, Molotov very bluntly said that the Soviet Union had no intention and no interest in establishing communist governments in Europe. Stability in Europe was the sine qua non of stability of the alliance. And if stability of the alliance was the Soviet goal, as it was during the war and for years after the war, then the revolution could be sacrificed. And when, in 1944, Stalin became peculiarly aware that American policymakers were going to intervene against the left in Western Europe, he played the passive game and he charted out only certain zones in Eastern and Central Europe, contiguous to the Soviet Union, where his security was at stake as an area in which the Russians would intervene in any way directly. But there was a fly in the ointment, and that is that try as they would, the Soviet leaders couldn't quite control at all points the burgeoning of the land either in Europe or in Asia. They didn't create the left, and they couldn't completely control it. And consequently, for American policymakers, they had the evidence that in the failure to be able to control that left, they read complicity. And the Russians tried. They had, after all, these communist parties. And they posed to the Communist Party the alternative of obedience or success. Either you are obedient to the interests of the Soviet Union, or you go off on this wild goose chase of trying to succeed in a revolution. And for the most part, they controlled those Communist parties. And they got them to limit the purposes of the resistance and of the coalitions to something that was called anti-fascist, but that was not at all revolutionary. And in those places where they couldn't control those parties, namely Yugoslavia and China, those parties did make revolutions. And they were the first to break with the Soviet center. And so the reading of Soviet policy is in the very first instance 
a kind of response to that red scare which became that functional paranoia of the Cold War. But there is another part of the explanation of how bogus that red scare is. And that is that fundamentally, those resistance movements in Europe really couldn't make, for the most part, armed revolutions. They certainly couldn't make them with the presence of Anglo-American troops. They couldn't make them with armies that really could control them. And there are two parts to that explanation. In the first place, the role of the Communist Party. The Communist parties, after all, built tremendous support, built tremendous prestige, but they built that support and prestige on the basis, first of all, of patriotism, that they were the most vigorous, the most courageous fighters in this struggle against the occupier, and secondly, on the basis of their reformism, that they promised some kind of refurbished democracy, that they could appeal not only to the working class strata of the cities, but to the rural masses. They called for some kind of democratic change in their particular societies. But when it came to a tactic, the tactic was always the tactic of the United Front, the tactic of a very broad-based movement against fascism, which meant that they would never go so far as to frighten off the moderate elements in that particular coalition. All of which meant that the Communist Party sat as a kind of moderator within the resistance movement, critically important when you stop to speak of the strength of those particular parties. But the second thing is even more practical, and that is that the resistance movements in Europe, for the most part, the primary exception being Yugoslavia, that for the most part the resistance movements were very small until 1943 and are big only in 44 and 45, by which we mean that they really are simply a hardcore of very devoted, politized militants in the early stages of the war and that they get a mass in the later stages. And what does that explain to you? What it means is that they became big only when the chance of success became apparent. And by the chance of success, I mean the approach of armies, the approach of allied armies that could help these resistance movements. The resistance movements tried no great operations when they felt they were destined to failure. They tried their operations under the cover of these advancing armies. But from the point of view of making a revolution, that is self-defeating because these occupying armies, these liberating armies, then, in the interest of social stability, will contain what the resistance might otherwise have done. And so, if the resistance couldn't make the kind of armed revolution American policymakers were talking about, if the Russians were working feverishly to be a conservative and moderating force, why did the Americans ply that lie? In part because they bought it from the old ruling classes of Europe. And all of those old pensioners of the class system of pre-war Europe were going to American policymakers and warning them about Bolshevism because it was the only lie that would get them back into office under American protection. But something more important than that, that American policymakers were primarily interested in American interests. They were not concerned to make a proper reading of Soviet policy, not concerned to evaluate the strength of these resistance movements. What they saw on the horizon was the possibility of democratic change that they might not be able to accommodate to their needs. 
And that is perfectly apparent in an astonishing document that comes from Edward Stettinius, who replaced Cordell Hall as the Secretary of State in 1944. That same Stettinius, who is the son of a partner in the Morgan Bank, who represents, after all, American interests at its center. And Stettinius provides in November of 1945 a memorandum called the United States Interest and Policy in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe. Now, Eastern Europe, of all places, by 1944, by November, had been staked out by the Soviet Union as important to its security, as we will see. And here is Titinius saying, what is our interest and what is our policy in Eastern Europe? And it goes in three points. Point one, that generous point that the countries of Eastern Europe shall have self-determination, that they shall be able to have any kind of system, any kind of government that their hearts desire. Point two, that in these states there shall be the open door, that there shall be no exclusive trading or investment patterns, that there shall be an open door to markets, an open door to trade and investment. And third, that American trade and investments shall be protected there. Would you see the point that points number two and three of Stettinius counterband number one? Because what numbers two and three say is that Eastern Europe will be capitalist. And what if those countries, after all, didn't want it? What if they didn't want those old ruling classes that were so abominable to come back after the war? But you see, Stettinius operated on the premise, first of all, that those old ruling classes would be welcomed back. Secondly, that there was no interest in social revolution in Eastern Europe, except as it was imported from the Soviet Union. Now, we know perfectly well that the United States didn't have fiat in Eastern Europe. And it was impossible, really, to call the tune there. But in Western Europe, in Central Europe, where American strategists saw a vacuum, where they saw pestilence and hunger, which fuel and which ignite radicalism, where they saw the programs of resistance movements calling for a new society. In those areas, yes, they would fill the vacuum with American power, and they would use the resources at their disposal to revoke the results of the Second World War. And so it is in Italy. It is in Italy toward the end of the war that the United States makes the trial run of the corollary of intervention. Because it is in Italy that the United States faces during the war for the first time, face to face, a resistance movement and a burgeoning left. Now Italy had gone into the Second World War miserably. It had gone into the Second World War on the 10th of July of 1940, when France was almost finished off, and Mussolini thought it was a good time to lop off a part of France and a part of the French Empire. And so those early stages of the war for Italy were successful. And they occupied southeastern France, and they occupied the, French, the North African zones of the French Empire, and then it all went bad and Mussolini just didn't have it. And consequently, British troops drove Italian armies out of Black Africa, Ethiopia, and Libya. And the uh, Italian troops lost heavily half their number on the Russian front. And then that effort to invade Greece became a fiasco and a heroic counterattack by the Greeks. And then by 1942, they are the cities of North Italy, Turin, and Milan, and Genoa, that are being bombed by Allied aviation. July of 1943, and it is Rome that is bombed, and it is the United States Army that occupies Sicily, and Mussolini is finished. 
And the finishing act is interesting. And fascism was losing every day whatever sliver of support it might have been able to count upon. On the 4th of March of 1943, mark it in your mind, if you like dates of heroism, that on the 4th of March of 1943, there had been a great and explosive open political strike by the factory workers of Fiat in Turin, in which they had openly denounced for the first time in 20 years that it had happened in Italy, the fascist regime. And after that, political figures who had long been in exile or in the underground began to reappear to surface. Political parties began to be reformed, not only the communist and the socialist parties, of course, which always kept their apparatus, but also a new left-wing socialist party called the Action Party, and of course the revival of that old Populare, that, Christ, that Catholic party, now rebaptized as the Christian Democratic Party. And the overthrow of Mussolini, if you like the history of France. The overthrow of Mussolini came from inside the fascist movement. The rats were running for cover. The regime was in danger, scuttled the big rat. And consequently, from two sources inside the power structure, Mussolini began to be targeted. First, inside the core, around Vittorio Emanuele III, that absolutely atrocious little king who had brought on Mussolini in October of 1922, now scared that he would lose his throne in a revolution, and with him, Marshal Pietro Badoglio, that Badoglio who had been the so-called conqueror of Ethiopia, who had had so many decorations from fascism itself, and his court proof yes, they organized to say an end to the fascist regime, and a restoration of the old aristocratic monarchical regime, the monarchical constitution before Mussolini. And inside the fascist higher command, there were two former foreign ministers. There was Vito Grandi, there was Galeazzo Ciano, who was the son-in-law himself of Mussolini, and they said, oh well, the Duce has to go. And he has to go in order to save our skin. And consequently, what they called for was a liberal fascist regime, whatever that strange contradiction in terms means. <laughs> And so it came on the 24th of July of 1943 that the Fascist Grand Council met in a historic meeting, feverish, full of recriminations, for 10 hours to find a solution and came up with this, that power in Italy should be turned over to the king. And the next day, Vittorio Emanuel, the 25th of July, declared that Mussolini was dismissed as the head of government and that he was replaced by Pietro Madonio, the conqueror of Ethiopia. And Madonio immediately put Mussolini under arrest and put him for safekeeping in an Apennine ski resort where he should be out of circulation. <laughs> Ludicrous. That after 20 years of fascism, when there was joy on the street, the kind of joy that Rossellini captured in the open city, joy on the streets when the announcement that Mussolini had fallen was heard, people dancing and singing in the streets, and every day, in every moment, disintegrating that fascist regime, ludicrous that the state should now be in the hands of the king who had brought on Mussolini and of the Badoglio who had taken his decorations. And the non-socialist and non-communist political parties, a coalition of six of them, headed by Ivanoe Baloni, asked Badoglio to broaden the base of the government, and that he refused to do. A principle, how to stay in power if you are implicated in the old order? How to stand head against a popular movement? What was Badoglio's ploy? What was the king's ploy? How against all of Italian society, with their having alienated every sector of it, how to stay in power well? The Americans. 
So you open negotiations for an armistice. Madoya opens secret negotiations for an armistice. And he tries to make terms with Sawdust Hero, to make terms to Eisenhower and the Americans. And he says, you will make an armistice with us, we will lay down our arms, but you will invade Italy north of Rome, so that you will save the capital. Because quite obviously, after the fall of Mussolini, the Nazis poured troops over the Brenner Pass and began to occupy the country, had already occupied the northern part. And the Americans refused. That was not in their military plan. It was too difficult to invade north of Rome, and consequently the negotiations dragged on until the 3rd of September. By that time, the Nazis had occupied Rome and most of northern and central Italy. And that armistice of the 3rd of September knocked Italy out of the war. On that very same day that the United States Army invaded the mainland at Naples. The 9th of September of 1943, Badoglio and the king and what was left of the Italian government fled from Rome, went to the southeast to Brindisi, then to Salerno. They would not get back to Rome until June of 1944. And on the 12th of October of 1943, for what it was worth, they declared war on Nazi Germany. Now, as far as American policymakers were concerned, they rather liked the Dolio. And Roosevelt writes to Churchill on the 30th of July of 1943, and he says, We must treat with any person or persons in Italy who can give us first an armistice, and secondly, solid assurance against social disorder. Now, Madonio and the king promised to give that kind of buttress against social disorder, but they couldn't, and that was their problem. They had no support in the country, and consequently against the Nazi occupation, against the puppet Mussolini regime which the Nazis established in the north of Italy in the little town of Salo, against those regimes, partisan and liberation movements began to develop. Italy was getting radicalized. And even on the 1st of January of 1944, those six non-socialist parties met in the city of Bari under the leadership of Benedetto Croce and of Carlo Sforza, and they said that the king must abdicate and Badoglio must go. Now Eisenhower's position, since he was in charge of the American army as he was going into Italy, was the position that the State Department adopted. That it would go with the king, and it would go with Badoglio, until Rome was reoccupied. In other words, a holding operation changed nothing. But Rome was not reoccupied until the 15th of June of 1944. During that time, another force developed. And that force was the force of the resistance. And the Italian resistance was fantastic. And it is that, after all, which was the great contribution of all of those Italian directors after the war, who showed us something about what that street fighting and what those parties of the really were. A movement, you see that the OSS, the, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the predecessor of the CIA, estimated in the beginning of 1945 at 185,000 armed partisans and 500,000 others in an infrastructure of support. Now the Americans were worried. And Eisenhower had issued a directive in July of 1943 to attempt to take care of that. The directive was as follows. No political activity whatsoever shall be countenanced during the period of military government. Well, that's all right in the places in which the American army occupied, but they moved very slowly. They didn't get to Rome until June of 44. They didn't get to Florence until August of 44. And they barely advanced beyond that by April of 45. And all over the north, and the north center of Italy, they are partisan who are fighting the Nazis and are fighting the puppet regime at Salo. 
That puppet regime at Stalin, when you see it, is the great, great contribution of Pierre Pasolini to have made in that posthumous film of his called Salo a picture of what fascism is and of what that peculiar puppet regime was up on Lake Garda. Because what Pasolini has left us is a, an impassioned document that tells us that all of the barbarism comes out of societies when fascism feels threatened, and so it was barbaric, and the struggles generated a tremendous partisan movement. At the heart of it were the communists in the Garibaldi legions. They occupied about two-fifths of the space in the Italian resistance movement. And those communists, in accordance with the line that I have already developed for you, were moderate. They were not interested in pushing to a revolution. They were interested in keeping a broad front. But, rank and file, 182,000, 500,000 in, in infrastructure. Society isn't a laboratory. The world isn't a well-made play. History isn't a scenario. And what about all of those people with guns? And what about all of those aspirations? A problem for American containment. And they thought of playing the liberal line for a little while. That maybe the king ought to go. Maybe somebody better than Badoglio, a liberal somewhere along the line. Maybe that would be better. And suddenly they found that the British didn't want that. The British were there too, and Italy had been theirs before the war. That was their market, and Churchill had affection for kings, and, he had affection for and consequently the Americans suddenly found that the British were making claims to that post-war market. A resistance movement on the one hand, the British on the other, and then suddenly, in March of 1944, the Russians, they intervened and they said, we recognize the king and the Dolino. And we think that the Italian communists ought to support the Badoglio government. And we do this because this is the best resistance against fascism, the best way of fighting the war against the Germans. And suddenly the Americans are there and they can't even put their liberal in. And this resistance movement is growing. And the American army is marching. And all of that is a paradigm of the contemporary world. And all of that worked its way out in Italy. And I assure you, not to the advantage of the Italians.